This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, Dr. Eleanor, Eleanor Gay joined the Department of Coins and Medals at the British Museum in 2007, where she began creating the database records for the collections of Iron Age, Roman and Roman Republican coinage, and earlier Roman Imperial series. Alongside her curatorial duties, which are many, she has continued working on publishing Roman coin hoards, even thanks to a AHRC-funded research project run by the British Museum and the University of Leicester, uh, which went from 2013 to 2016. She is the author of three monographs, an edited volume, and several articles ranging from the monetary circulation patterns in Iron Age and Roman Britain to the star study of Gallo-Roman sanctuaries and the deposition, monetary deposition in their context. So join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Gay with us. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Lucia, for welcoming me and for the introduction. And I'm excited to be able to talk to you today. Uh, my name is Eleanor Gay. I'm curator of Iron Age and Roman coin hoards at the British Museum um, in the Department of Coins and Medals. And it's probably the best job in the world, I think. It means I get to see all the, the hoards that come in as I mean, treasures. We, you sure, you're right. You're at the British Museum. We think that we also have a job that's not as very bad. I mean, as, as a Roman curator, the American is mad because it's not as bad. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> So um, today I'm going to talk about my work at the British Museum studying coin hoards submitted for treasure under the Treasure Act and a bit more about what that means. I'm trying to try not to bore you with too much legal um, background, but I think it's just important to get the context of this work that we do and the limitations of that. I'm also going to give an overview of what we know about the pattern of hoarding in the British Isles and uh, talk about how these new hordes that are coming in all the time are continuing to develop our picture of the past. So um, what do we mean when we talk about a horde? Well, we're all familiar with the, the sort of dictionary definition of a hoard, which is a collection of valuable items uh, possibly stored or hidden away for later use. But I'm working in the particular legislative framework of uh, the Treasure Act, which replaced the medieval law of treasure trove in England and Wales and in relation to precious items discovered for which no owner could be traced. These reverted to the ownership of the crown uh, traditionally, and in fact still do. These days, though, the process is administered by a government department working with a team at the British Museum with the Secretary of State acting on the Crown's behalf. So I have here the, the definition of treasure today uh, as it is for coins, although on Monday this will be slightly different as an amendment to the Act is coming into force, but I'm not going to talk about that now. So you see in coin terms, this means a hoard of two or more precious metal coins or ten or more base metal coins. Though in practice, of course, the hoards are a lot larger than that, um, particularly in the Roman period where we have huge base metal hoards. Um, it also covers associated artefacts and containers, the pot that the hoard is in, and any objects such as jewellery, for example, with it. They will have to be over 300 years old and they will have to be of the same find, which is where the, 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 the arguments can take place about um, what can be considered to be buried together at one time. The definition of treasure also, uh, also includes accumulations of things, uh, things that were covered by the old law of treasure trove, um, which mainly finds a more recent date deliberately concealed whose owners cannot be traced. So when I mean uh, accumulation, I should say, I mean um, sort of things like uh, coins going into a well as a temple site that might be considered to be uh, a votive deposit that might have built up over time, but are still essentially in the same place. So what happens today when someone finds treasure? It's quite a complicated process. I'd say uh, the majority of finds are reported to the British Museum's Portable Antiquities Service now, which has a network of finds liaison officers based in uh, museums and local government offices throughout England and Wales. 
and they act as an intermediary between the finder, these days often metal detectorists, and, and the uh, officials running the process. So in a procedure established under the law of treasure trove, um, Her Majesty's coroner is still involved. And the, we, the British Museum, play a statutory role in this process, preparing a report for the coroner, advising on whether the find meets the requirements of potential treasure, and identifying and recording the contents of the hoard. Um, this is my job. So this is posterity for, for research information, but also perhaps primarily to help this process. If a local museum wishes to acquire the find, the coroner will hold an inquest and then the find will then go on to be valued independently by an independent valuer commissioned by the Treasure Evaluation Committee. And they work to the list of um, contents of the hoard that we provide. When the price for the hoard is agreed, the museum will be able to fundraise to acquire the hoard and the reward is usually split between the finder and the landowner, though there are often exceptional circumstances for this. Uh, for example, sometimes if there's been bad practice, a reward might be withheld. Um, the, the, the practice now, I mean, in, in earlier years, the tendency were, was for treasure items to come to the British Museum as a matter of course, but now um, things have gone the other way, really, and we prefer for um, hoards to be acquired locally. And this process has been remarkably successful in getting hoards into museums all over the country. So of course, there's a long history of um, coin hoards being found in this country, right from um, antiquity to the present day. But since the uh, late 20th century, the hobby of metal detecting has really expanded. And I'd say the majority of hoards are found um, in this way now. This has always been a legal um, activity in the UK with the landowner's permission apart from in certain restricted areas like um, scheduled ancient monuments, for example. So the Treasure Act was brought in in 1996 to mitigate against, against this loss of heritage through metal detecting, though sadly some illicit finds are still reported, uh, are still not reported, sorry, and uh, this is something the police are taking increasingly seriously. Generally, though, I think the, the, the new Treasure Act has been a success and something we're always striving for is improvement of the quality of the data recorded and collaboration between finders and archaeologists. So just to um, illustrate this enormous increase in cases, the, the, the purple area in this graph uh, represents finds made by metal detectorists. Um, you can see this graph is a little bit out of date now and, and that, that increase is just carrying on almost sort of exponentially, um, which, which, you know, it requires a lot of resource on our part. Um, finds are still discovered by other methods, of course, um, chiefly during agricultural and building work. Um, building work was uh, a major um, method of discovery uh, in the early 19th century when we had a lot of hordes being um, discovered through the construction of the railways and farmers still find these, these, these hordes that are turned up by the plough in fields and nowadays often the metal searchers will be working on the field that has been ploughed and the, the hordes that are being found are, are often scattered and out of their original context. Professional archaeologists are still required to declare finds of um, treasure as well, although in practice these tend to go um, with the archive of the, the, the archaeological site, wherever that ends up. So I'd say approximately 70 to 80 Iron Age and Roman coin hoards are now being reported each year, although some of these may be new batches from existing find sites that come up um, every so many years, probably because of uh, increasing deep ploughing over a period of time. Lucia mentioned the, 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 the research project that we carried out with the University of Leicester in uh, 2013 funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Um, a lot of the things I'm going to talk about today are informed by that research. It, it was really a, a project initially to record all Iron Age and Roman coin hoards from Britain, including the many historic and antiquarian records of hoards found before modern records began, some of which contained very useful information. And we also hold archives and full paper files in this department, which detail a lot of information about hoards that 
hadn't been recorded in publications elsewhere. Um, and Robertson's 2000 corpus of um, hordes was based on research that dated back from the 30s onwards. And um, since that point, there have been so many more discoveries that it was worth revisiting this, this work and bringing all this into the uh, Port of Antiquity Skin database where these records now sit. So the general pattern of hordes in Britain is shown on this map with Roman hordes as dark dots and Iron Age ones as lighter in colour. They might be a bit difficult to see. Um, this broadly reflects the general distribution of coinage in um, Britain, which in Roman Britain, which runs in a band really from the southwest to the southeast from the seven to the wash and then up into some military areas you can see the um the dots picking out hadrian's wall in this area of the map however there are some differences in the distribution of hordes compared to the general coin pattern i'll talk more about some of these later but um you can see that hordes uh, are also clustering in some coastal areas and some upland areas where we have less use of roman coinage generally that maybe that these things are being aware are buried away from population centres. Well, I'll come back to the findings of this project throughout, but it allowed us to build up a general pattern for hoarding in Britain and to compare hoards to background coin loss. Um, this is mainly due to the superb level of data generated through the Portable Antiquities Stream database. Um, I should say that reporting of um, single finds that aren't treasure is voluntary, but um, local finds lace officers work tirelessly to encourage people to report things they've found, and we have a really good coverage of single finds, making it a very rich resource to interrogate. Here are the Roman hordes in blue, um, sorry, in red, are plotted against what we call the um, British mean, which is um, a pattern established for the background levels of coin use for certain key periods. This is based on the work of Philippa Walton for her thesis published in 2012. So you can see here there's a clear pattern of relatively low levels of coin loss in the first century AD and, and also a pause um, increasing um, through the Antonine period and um, then reducing the reduction in supply in the early third century, peaking dramatically in the later third century alongside the debasement of the coinage due to inflation. What was most interesting to me about these results was um, not the confirmation of the late third century high peaks of hoarding, which was as expected, and we, you know, we feel this by the amount of third century hoards that are continually being brought into the museum, but in fact the higher levels of hoarding in the mid fourth century set against the much higher levels of ordinary coin loss. You see here in the peak here. To my mind, this shows a fully monetized economy for perhaps the first time and for a relatively short period. The late fourth century, of course, and early fifth century hoarding peak is, is well known and this is also a distinctively British phenomenon. So that's that's enough graphs, I think, for now. What I want to do is take you on a whistle-stop tour of the long tradition of hoarding in the British Isles, starting right back in the Bronze Age. I'm an archaeologist by background, and I think it's helpful to step back in time and see the wider picture of hoarding, which occurs at many points in time. And in prehistoric studies, it's clearly accepted as not always being for pragmatic reasons. There's a bit of a disjuncture here between the way hordes are interpreted in um, archaeology and in numismatics, I think, still. The earliest Bronze Age hordes um, of gold objects, followed by a base metal hordes, which have a particular horizon in the late Bronze Age to early Iron Age transitions is when we get these hordes of um, socketed axes, for example, which are found in large numbers also, and also count as treasure within the treasure acts. I didn't talk about artifacts, which have their own different rules there. It's important to be aware that people encountered these finds as they went about their daily, um, daily life, their daily interactions with the land and farming, for example. These beautiful miniature shields from the Salisbury Hoard on the right were found with reburied Bronze Age objects. Um, this was a hoard that then been 
added to in this particularly personal and communal way, perhaps by a largest number of people. The shields are all different and they're beautifully made. It's, it's hard to see on the image, but they're incised with these lovely swirling Celtic art style designs in some cases. And they have quite realistic handles with rivets on the back. And um, to my mind, this perhaps is something that's associated with the rediscovery of these Bronze Age objects and these new finds being made to perhaps rededicate or redeposit this earlier hoard in the context of late Iron Age hoarding, which involves um, the burial of objects and um, miniature objects, particularly are something that found from the late Iron Age through into the Roman period. Um, Particularly miniature weapons which are found on um, Romano Celtic shrines in, in Britain and Greece. So later in the Iron Age, hordes of objects were deposited from time to time, but coins quickly became part of this behaviour once they were adopted in Britain from the mid to late second century BC onwards. Two sites here have shed some light on the process. Um, at Snettisham in Norfolk on the left, a whole sequence of hoards uh, were deposited in a large enclosed area with these striking deposits of torques in various states of damage and repair. This site was excavated quite a long time ago now, but um, work is currently underway, or well underway, to publish this as a British Museum research publication, and we've been re examining the coins as part of that. So these talks were joined by Iron Age coins and deposits. The Great Talk, famous Great Talk in the British Museum, had a quarter stator lodged in one of its terminals. Further so individual coins or groups of coins were deposited in the surrounding area of this enclosure well into the Roman period, both singly and in, in little hordes. So this activity took place over quite a long period at an important site. The recently discovered Le Catillon II hoard from Jersey also came under the treasure process quite recently, despite the Channel Islands having their own legal framework and separate government, they um, still are under the Crown, so um, took on the precedent of the Treasure Act in, in that case. This was a huge mass of silver status from the North French coastal region that had been tipped into a pit along with some gold talks. You can just see one peeking out here among the silver coins. I should say I'm thankful I didn't have to catalogue them, as luckily the Channel Islands has their own resident expert on this coin in the form of Philip de Jersey. But arguably, again, these hoarding events are about visible public destruction of wealth and have a communal element to them. Footprints were seen on the surface of the mass of coins in the Jersey hoard. It's a great solid lump of coins. And this conjures up an image of someone stamping up and down on them as they were buried. Later in the British Iron Age, coin hoards became more frequent and there's considerable variation in the types and denominations found in hoards. Metals are mixed in some areas and not in others. Some regions have predominantly gold coinage, others silver, although this is uh, broadly a chronological trend from gold to silver over time. During um, the lockdown of 2020, I started to hear reports of what is possibly the largest gold hoard from Britain, certainly in recent times. This is something I talked about at INC in Warsaw. This is the, the Bado hoard of 933 gold status from Essex. Remarkably, all but three of these are of the same type, uh, the modern chase type. Um, and that's interesting because the Warden Chase Hoard found in the 19th century might actually be the largest hoard of gold coins from Britain, but unfortunately it was quite dispersed on discovery, so we'll never really get the full scale of that. Um, these are a sort of slightly eastern variant of the Warden Chase type, um, found some distance away, uh, almost the other end of this, this, this area of coin produ production region. So um, remarkably, all but three of these coins are of the same type, with only two reverse dies represented, and possibly just one obverse die. I'm still working on this, but this seems to represent a single striking sequence, with the obverse design, uh, the obverse die being reworked during this process. So it's quite hard to see that long striking sequence when um, continual changes are being made to the obverse, but it does seem to be the same die. So arguably the coins are being struck to go straight into the hoard, which I think also says something important and interesting about Iron Age coinage. It, there's a lack of use wear here. The wear we see is dye wear.
The site of Hallerton in Leicester has been hugely influential in the way we think about Iron Age hoarding. We're increasingly aware of multiple um, deposits and sites of sequential de deposition where people bury hoards over a, a long period of time, but all too often these have been ploughed up and scattered. Iron Age hoards have also got a particular tendency to be found in batches over many years, which may be perhaps a testament to their dispersed nature. Uh, it's not necessarily that they're being ploughed up in deeper, deeper levels, but perhaps that the plough is disturbing more than one hoard. But unfortunately, that's hard to see in, in a, a very um, frequently ploughed field. Here in Hallerton, the hordes were still in situ and represented several phases of deposition. Early imported coinage found with animal bones at the entrance to an enclosure and a cluster of 14 individual coin hordes of mostly local silver coinage from the northeastern region with some Roman denarii, as well as deposits of spectacular Roman cavalry helmets. And there's some shown here still in their block in the laboratory being excavated by conservators. The reconstruction of these um, moulded cavalry helmet cheek pieces were incredibly um, painstaking. Uh, you can see that they were filled with silver coins and there's also the jaw of a pig visible there. So it's a sort of um, typical traditional offering of military equipment and animal sacrifices that you get at shrines in Gaul, but perhaps not so much commonly in Britain. Roman coins are present at the site, so uh, this therefore represents a key transition period between Iron Age and Roman Britain. It's, we're not really sure who's bearing these coins, which, which uh, to my mind they're the local people. Clearly, but the, the, the Roman military element is slightly interesting here. Um, working with site assemblages from Snettersham and, and Ashwell here in Hertfordshire has also influenced my thinking about hordes and the importance of looking at coins in relation to other artifact categories. Ashwell in particular has a long history of deposition and attests to enduring memories of plates. Here, a fairly ephemeral structure dated from the Iron Age attracted deposits of Iron Age and Roman coins over a long period, including small hordes of coins and objects dating to the Hadrianic period, uh, but including items such as Bronze Age weapons uh, kept for a long time or possibly rediscovered again. Um, the deliberately broken head of a Roman clay figurine and this uh, pierced Claudian copy uh, found alongside non-local Iron Age coins from the area. So this structure was originally the focus for um, activities such as feasting in the Iron Age, but um, possibly several centuries later was used to deposit this Roman temple treasure that is shown in the slide here of uh, votive clerks, jewellery and um, statuette of the goddess who was a previously unknown deity called Sununa. We know this because she has an inscribed base which is not actually shown in this photo. So it's actually the discovery of this hoard of objects by a metal detectorist that prompted further research and excavation of the site which appears in all other respects um, from survey to be a fairly ordinary Romano British native settlement site. As we move into the Roman period, there's quite a difference between the established areas of Iron Age coin use, which are um, shown in, in, on the left hand side here, um, restricted to the south and east mainly, and slightly up the east coast of Britain. And there's contrast between that and the location of the earliest towards of Roman coins. The other map shows pre-Claudian Roman coin hoards. Um, Roman Republican coins, the, the hordes are uh, sorry, in, in black dots and the single finds are in grey dots. Roman Republican coins in particular have been found in small hordes in the west of Britain. And I think it's now generally accepted that these are certainly reaching Britain before the Roman conquest. And it has been suggested that they have been used as a source of silver for local Iron Age coins melted down. So it might be interesting to think about where these are being accepted and where they aren't being accepted and where people are preferring to um, produce their own coinage and use that in these deposition practices. The adoption of Roman complexes, uh, Roman coinage is a complex picture. We have um, 
quartz from Denari, which are found with uh, local Iron Age silver in the East Anglian area, such as in the Eriswell Hoard, which is shown here, but generally not in other places. Um, the other images of a recent hoard from Asker's well in Dorset, shown um, consisting of uh, 628 silver denarii to AD 85. So uh, a high proportion of Roman Republican coins were still circulating in the Flavian period in quite a worn state. The Roman Republican coin, which had a long duration in British hordes, with the more debased legionary denarii found in hordes well into the second century AD and even beyond. When carrying out analysis of the hordes from Britain, I kept finding the data was skewed by the enormous silver hoard from Shapwick in Somerset of uh, over 9,000 9, coins. This is a denarius hoard dating to the Severan period. This hoard is found in what seems to be a large rural villa. However, even removing this hoard from the data set leaves a Severan peak of denarius deposition. Many of these denarii are actually Antonine in date, but we can see an influx of new coinage in the early Severan period, which does seem to be ending up in hoards relatively swiftly, including hoards in areas beyond the Empire in Scotland. It's remarkable how a significant amount of wealth was ending up in rural areas by this time, and after this date, the supply of coinage is much reduced. One thing the Hall project allowed us to do was to compare the date of coins in the hoards with the date of the hoards in which they were found. When we look at base metal denominations by hoard date, a striking contrast between the site finds and the hoards can be seen. Whilst Dupondi and Asses are common site finds in Romano British sites, and they're in uh, green, ye yellow, and red here. Um, the Cisterci, shown here in purple, dominate the hoards. Uh, the comparable graph for um, site finds has almost no purple in it. I was surprised to find that the Cisterci present in the hoard record were overwhelmingly concentrated in later third century hoards, including some fairly large hoards, presumably destined for recycling, which contrasts with the use of lower denominations which weren't hoarded. The Antonine Long Horsley Hoard in Northumberland also contained a casting flue, which was a clue to the use of these coins. Given the short of the latest Cisterci, we can't be certain it wasn't deposited at a later date than the Antonine period. These coins are certainly a source of um, valuable metal, but the use of monetarily worthless coins as offering should also be remembered. A large deposit of these coins was found in a modified spring known as Coventina's Well, also in Northumberland, um, not far from Hadrian's Wall. So perhaps we see a, a movement of metal up to this point that isn't really being used and is then repurposed locally. One potential use of the recycled cisterci is to make imitations of late third century coins so-called barbarous radiates. Analytical work by Matt Ponting seems to suggest that the metal composition of these is in keeping with the Sturcy being used as a source for these uh, radiates. However, it seems that the manufacture of these is often quite local, and a number of recent coins of of these imitations have shown dialing groups of coins. Um, they're fairly schematic. They can range from quite good imitations to what we have here, sort of basically just the suggestion of a, a radiate crown. The radiate part seems very important, obviously, it denotes this denomination, but I don't think these were intended to deceive necessarily. Um, reverse often shows sort of stick man type deity. These coins also have a very variable fabric and presumably variable metal content, sometimes being made from small snipped pieces of metal rather than fully formed blanks. This tantalising but sadly undated assemblage found in Fenish Stratford near Milton Keynes appears to be a complete forger's tool kit, considering of, uh, it consists of three vessels containing separate groups of, um, in the middle of a small pellet, which might be a refined raw material for melting down, chunky discs um, on one side, and finally what appears to be unstruck blanks. 
Unfortunately, the dyes associated with the board uh, were not able to yield any clues in the form of engraved designs uh, of an appropriate date, but the thinking of metal composition is that these might be uh, kit for making imitation radiates. Uh, at the British Museum, we're currently collaborating with Reading University, looking at copper alloy composition throughout the first millennium AD, and hope that a study of barbarous radiates will be included in this programme of work. I think there's a lot to be done here. The Bow Street Hall from Bath is uh, perhaps a highlight for me. This was excavated by professional archaeologists working on the site in advance of redevelopment in the centre of Bath. The hall was found up against the interior wall of a Roman building and lifted as a block. You can see it's um, rather terrifyingly being lifted on a board by a crane here uh, in unenviably wet conditions. As the hoard was too large for the X-ray facilities at the museum at the time in 2010, it was sent to the new Biz facility at Southampton University, where they were able to produce this incredible image here. You can see the presence of at least six separate parcels of coinage seen from above here in the block. We'd hope that these were would be able to still be located when it came to excavate the soil block um, in the laboratory. This is the work that's done by our conservators in the Department of Scientific Research at the British Museum. Uh, but this actually exceeded our expectations in that the outline of the remains of skin or leather bags were clearly visible surrounding the coins. You can see this sort of orangey brown material sticking to the coins here. It's very degraded, but it's pres preserving the shape of the bags, these money bags. They show that the hoard had been sorted into eight different groups, divided largely by denomination and metal content. The assemblage consisted of denarii, um, the earliest being a worn Mark Antony legionary series denarius here in the AD 270s, high silver content radiates and baser radiates up to the tetrarchy. It therefore seems that the assemblage was sorted um, before being buried in the AD 270s, but it could have been assembled over a period of several decades, as by the time of deposition, the higher silver content coins were out of circulation. Unfortunately, not all late 3rd century hoards are as exciting as Bow Street Hoard, and along with mid 4th century hoards, they make up the bulk of my work. Our AHRC project mentioned earlier was a chance to stop and take an overview of the period with a particular reference to whether the late third century hoarding horizon in Britain was a result of a wider economic crisis in Britain. As the graphs I showed earlier demonstrated, we found that the number of hoards of the state was not out of proportion with the background coin circulation pattern for this period. The exceptional size of hoards such as Froome shown here being excavated and the Canetio hoard is in part then a reflection of the low value of the contemporary coinage due to inflation. However, the picture is ever more uh, nuanced uh, as ever. It's more nuanced than it might first appear. The Canetio hoard is far from typical, being in fact two hoards that were unfortunately retrieved in less than ideal circumstances and were mixed up prior to being studied, although you can see this in the, in the composition of the hoard. The ongoing work on the Froome hoard, excavated in much better circumstances, has likewise shown some internal differentiation with a cluster of coins of Crausius, the latest in the hoard, found in the centre of the pot, which suggests that the pot was placed in the ground and filled from several uh, separate containers. Analysis of the assemblage of late third century hoards, um, which continued beyond the reforms of Aurelian, which I think these reforms had little impact on the coinage in Britain, shows remarkable homogeneity and therefore it seems that these hoards are more a product of factors continuing up until the very end of the third century and not of the crises of the AD 260s. The impact of the third century crisis is also not supported by the archaeological evidence in Britain although there's continuing debate about this. Although there are some fortifications of towns, uh, there seem to be, to be little reduction in rural settlement and urban and military spaces alike continue to be used, albeit with some changes in the manner of that use. As we go into the fourth century, there does seem to be a trend towards more organized and systematic extraction of materials and crops, 
perhaps for taxation in kind. And the local elites seem to have had a role in this exploitation of resources to the empire. Until this time, Britain continued to receive very little coinage that's um, new and fresh. The barbarous radiates are traditionally dated to this interim period between um, the Orionic reforms and the end of the third century. But clearly the poor quality regular coinage also continued to circulate in huge amounts and precise dating of any part of this period should be therefore treated with caution. As ever, this pattern is regionally varied. I'm sorry, it's another graph. In the third century hordes, um, seem to make a more significant proportion in relation to single finds in the southwest uh, compared to areas further east, which have little hoarding and higher levels of coin use. Here, the, the solid um, peaks are the hordes, and the uh, outlying peaks are the single finds. You see, the southwest is really essential for hoarding. Many factors are at work here. I think it's wrong to imagine the southwest as a backwater receiving old coinage, as there's a concentration of later Roman villa and temple sites in this area. However, there does also appear to be a significant amount of forgery happening in these regions. There are clusters of coin molds and barbarous radiate hordes in the Somerset levels, which is a low-lying area without high population density. We also have evidence of mineral extraction and other industrial activity in North Wales in the late 3rd century. So it's perhaps reasonable suggest to suggest that this money is being exchanged for resources or raises taxes in this area, but for whatever reason it's not made it back into the system. Going back to the Bow Street Horde, it's also difficult to disentangle the religious and commercial spheres. I think, in fact, they're inextricably linked, so you probably shouldn't try and separate them. Arguably, the centre of Bath is a, the entire town of Bath is a religious precinct in which a certain amount of commercial activity took place. The place in which the hoard was found was near some baths fed by a hot spring which was venerated elsewhere on the site. In fact, the development was taking place in the Victorian Spa Hospital with earlier roots. We don't have any evidence that the particular coins of the Bow Street Horde were thrown into the spring and fished out and hoarded, but people think that they don't have that appearance compared to the coins that were found in the Sacred Spring. But the presence of the shrine attracting visitors from all over Roman Britain and beyond goes some way to explain the accumulation of wealth in that place. Hordes with good archaeological context are crucial for our understanding of the late Roman economy, and sadly this is not always the case that, that they have this good archaeological context. And individual hordes in sealed context can tell quite a different story and challenge assumptions made from the general pattern of coin circulation. As an example, the Bradley, hoard, Bradley Hill Villa Hordes here found under a dated 4th century floor in the Roman villa in Somerset had a particularly archaic profile and it's evident the availability of radiates throughout the Tetrarchic period and beyond. These sort of discoveries make it challenging to reconstruct hordes which are scattered by ploughing which makes up the majority of finds I see. Um, somebody will submit a group of uh, coins clusters in the field and there has to be a decision made as to whether they might constitute a hoard or whether they might just be a general scatter of site finds. I don't think it's always clear cut. The early Tetrarchic period um, is an example of how the pattern of finds could be transformed by a few discoveries. Relatively few large hordes of the state were known, but we have had two significant finds in the past decade. The Wold Newton hoard from uh, Yorkshire and the Rossby hoard from Lincolnshire the latter containing over 3,000 nummy. These are the largest early Tetrarchic nummy mainly. Successive weight reductions of this period meant that this coinage does not seem to have circulated widely in Britain and has ended up in hoards, again perhaps destined for transit or recycling. These hoards are um, on the main routes up north near roads set aside from them but not too far away from them. These finds have had a significant impact on our understanding of the output of the London Mint as well, and it's feeding into work currently being undertaken by Hugh Cloak and Lee Toon. These hordes are being published together in the forthcoming Risk Museum Research publication at the moment. 
Moving through to the mid fourth century, the practice of removing coins from pots in layers paid off in the Shrewsbury hoard, where we can clearly see a hoard made up over time with the later coins of the AD 330s added to the top of the pot. These are the purple coins in the graph here. The 330s uh, mark a juncture in hoarding, with a few earlier coins present in many hoards of the state. Had all this been tipped into a bag and delivered to us, as sometimes still sadly happens, this past name would not have been detected. Something we tried to do when we go through our archive of old hoard records was to pay attention to objects found in hoards as well as the coins themselves. Traditionally, I think there's been a tendency for numismatists to ignore these associated objects, but there is so much more value in viewing the hoard as a whole. This mid fourth century hoard from Walter Newton in Huntingtonshire was accompanied by a diagram uh, drawn by the finder of how it was neatly stacked with the coins in a linen purse at the bottom of this metal container, which was then placed in a ceramic container. And above it were these two folded pieces of silver sheet, which um, equated to one and two Roman pounds in weight, respectively. And the whole thing had uh, an upturned vessel as a lid. Um, I think this hints it's an early transition to a bullion economy during the mid fourth century. We need to take more note of the weight of coin hoards, I think, at all times. Throughout the later 4th century, we see reuse happening in base metal hoards, again suggesting restricted supply and easy access to earlier coinage, and also a lack of official control over the coinage. The recycling of larger module um, later Constantinian and Valentinianic coinage is fairly well documented, but a recent hoard of over 2,000 coins from Winterslow in Wiltshire as evidence for cutting down of larger coins for was later the reign of Magnus Maximus. The coin at the top is a reparatio rei pub type. The hoard terminates in AD 402, and these hoards contend to, uh, tend to contain a lot of poorer quality coinage, apparently higher lead content, and they also mop up many smaller module coins from earlier periods of circulating, including radio copies. The final category of hoard I encounter on a regular basis, uh, a bit more fun, is the late Roman silver hoard made up of siliquae and more occasionally uh, including meliorentes and solidi. The majority of these hoards are dated to the latest issues of silver coinage commonly found in Britain, the, the, the latest influx of silver coinage reaching us in any large numbers, which are the siliquae of Arcadius Honorius um, minted in Milan at the very end of the 4th to early 5th century. These are, however, usually very clipped and are likely to have circulated well into the 5th century, which, of course, is the period of the famous Hoxton Hoard of coins and artefacts. I'm showing the wonderful pepper pots here. This is on display in the British Museum. This is a testament, I think, to the extraordinary level of wealth in the hands of the few at this time. Something interesting, the very late 4th to early 5th century, when this is a notable shift in the pattern of hoard distribution from the affluent southwestern areas, um, where we find the mid to late 4th century hoards, right at the end of the fourth, early 5th century, back to a southeastern pattern, which is very reminiscent of the uh, location of the hoards of the Iron Age and early Roman periods. Um, don't really have all the answers here, but whether this relates to the longevity of indigenous power networks after the collapse of Roman rule remains to be seen, I think. Roman coins, of course, continued to have an afterlife, appearing pierced in necklaces in early medieval cemeteries and treasured across the North Sea and beyond as bullion. Um, this treasure case from Oxborough contained four pendants which come from an early medieval cemetery context near a Roman site. Um, the oldest being uh, Denarius of Severus Alexander, which is notably worn and may have been rediscovered at the site or been in circulation and curated and kept for a long period of time. Also, sadly, perhaps this is an example of a find now separated from information about its burial context. It would be nice to see how this would have been um, worn and owned by the buried individual at the site. I'd like to end just by talking about some methodological considerations that underpin the work being done on hoards from discovery to analysis. 
hope I've managed to emphasize, I probably have repeatedly, throughout the importance of archaeological context in our interpretation of coin finds. We are working in an unprecedented period of removal of metal artifacts from the ground, but the British Museum's Portable Antiquities Scheme has played a huge role in educating metal detector users about the importance of this archaeological information associated with what they find. The excavation of coin hoards by professional archaeologists is the ideal and good relationships with local sources of expertise are crucial here in a very under-resourced sector. Often it's only possible to follow this up with a small area of excavation centred on the find, but that can still yield good results if the hoard is left in situ. For example, the hoard on the left here from Huntingdonshire was found to be buried within two vessels, one inside the other presumably as uh, insurance or reinforcement for the weight of coins. I think the pot might have broken under the weight of the coins before it was buried. The hoard on the right is the Rawsby hoard, which was in a stone-filled pit, into the fill of which was inserted a radiant hoard of slightly earlier date, presumably at the time of burial of the hoard. If it had been hooked out of the ground, this information might have been easily lost. So good retrieval practices go hand in hand with controlled excavation and recording. I think thanks in part to the publicity generated by the huge Froome Hoard, which was held up as an example of good practice, an increasing number of finders are leaving their discoveries in situ and calling for professional help to record and lift the discoveries as a block. This preserves the contents of any vessels or organic containers in the position in which they were deposited. Our conservators respond quickly to these finds, which are x-rayed before the best method of their, of their excavation and laboratory can be assessed. This process is expensive in terms of time and resources, but many hoards um, are recovered in quite a damp state and will deteriorate after discovery if not kept in the correct environment and removed from their container in a controlled manner. These images show a conservator carefully extracting what was thought to be a bung in the mouth of a pot containing coins. Um, they do clean the coins, but only to identification level only, um, as they are careful not to enhance the value of the hoard prior to the valuation process. Um, the hoard may go on to be returned to the finder, but this is to allow us to identify the good contents. When conservators are excavating hoards in the lab, they're always on the lookout for organic remains preserved in hoard containers. This happens quite frequently due to the presence of metal ions from corroding metal creating an environment that is toxic to microorganisms which would otherwise um, attack and destroy organic matter. So, for example, we found linen wrapped around stacks of individual coins which is still flexible as if it was buried yesterday. Anecdotally, the presence of textile wrapped reloads of coins seems particularly common in the fourth century and perhaps indicates coins freshly received or prepared for transit in batches rather than circulated as loose change. We've also had plant remains such as this spelt chaff, which is found packed around the coins in the Selby hoard, um, a late Antonine hoard. There's been some debate over whether this constituted a symbolic offering of food or was there for packing like some proto-silica gel. On balance, I would favour the symbolic um, interpretation given that these are miniature pots, um, miniature vessels, miniature objects, miniature weapons, uh, and again, another category that you often find in temple sites given in representation of the whole. But of course, none of this is very meaningful for the archaeological record without the accurate recording of fine spots. And the ideal would be wider geophysical survey uh, as well as targeted excavation to determine the relationship of boards as to yet unidentified archaeological sites. We've also recorded hordes in association with natural features. And you can see here this model of hordes along the River Don Valley or clusters on the high ground overlooking the river valley and um, clusters of hordes in certain points in the landscape. All these things need to be investigated further. The geophysical survey at the site of the Froome hordes yielded fairly ephemeral archaeological settlement traces which were on uncertain dates, but examination of the site also suggests proximity to a spring. The deposition of coins at springheads and in riverbeds is now attested throughout the Iron Age and Roman periods. 
although not technically hoards, the assemblages are now classed as treasure under the Treasure Act as coins deposited in the same place for the same purpose as part of ritualised practice. And this led to, for example, the enormous assemblage from Pierce Bridge um, being declared treasure, and that's now being published by Philip Walton and Hella Eckhard. So I hope we've managed to give you a flavour of the sort of hoards we see at the British Museum. The amount of new material is certainly a challenge, and although for many years people have been predicting that we've reached peak hoard, it doesn't really feel like that, um, that, that that's the case. So I hope very much that future archaeologists and numismatists are able to work more closely together and continue to put these finds in a wider context that sheds more light on the lives of those using finds in the past. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. I mean, this was uh, an amazing uh, presentation and I supremely enjoyed. I will, uh, I will just uh, begin with some questions uh, that we have, really, this was fantastic. I don't know if uh, Peter, who is here, wants to ask uh, the question directly or should I read it? No, okay. I'll just read it then. Um, is the concentration of coin hoards in Southeast England due to more coin use in those areas, more failure to recover hoards there in ancient times due perhaps to warfare, or three, uh, due to the fact that there is a different system in Scotland that might not encourage as much reporting? Um, that's sort of several things going on there. I think um, the, the, the concentration in Southeast England is certainly due to higher levels of romanization, if you want to use that word, I don't really, but uh, higher levels of coin use and slightly more integrated monetary economy at certain periods, but also perhaps that there's this pre-existing hoarding tradition in that place. I don't think there's any evidence particularly to suggest there's high levels of warfare. Um, it may be that slightly different things are happening right into the fifth century. In terms of Scotland, uh, I'm afraid I slightly omitted Scotland from some of my um, talking places, mainly because they have, um, as you suggest, a different legislative system. And in fact, anything discovered by a finder that's archaeological would be considered treasure so even single finds are considered treasure in scotland um obviously it's beyond most of it's well beyond the roman empire so um we don't find coins being used quite in the same way there but we do have some quite amazing spectacular hordes of roman coins that are being deposited and reach local societies particularly in the severan period um, perhaps I didn't emphasize those words enough, but I was mainly talking about the work I do as part of the England Wales well system, and those those uh, words are dealt with um, by the Treasury Unit in Edinburgh, and not by the Museum. Thank you very much. So uh, I don't know if Jean wants to ask the question in person, or should I read it? Uh, I'll ask. Do you find Roman or Byzantine scale weights in your coin hoards? You mentioned having to weigh silver, but how did you know what weight you had? <clears throat> I, I um, like scale weights. We, we don't tend to really. I mean, I think weights sometimes get into the later Viking hoards, but I can't recall an instance of finding one in a Roman hoard in Britain. I mean, I do weigh all the coins that come my way in, in certain periods. I don't weigh every single radius, but um, I would get mad. But I, um, we, we do weigh, weigh, for example, denarii and um, silica in particular. And we find that silica hoards often equate to particular weight, um, a proportion of Roman pound. For example, I'm working on at the moment that seems to be a third of a Roman pound, exactly. Thank you. And uh, Rick, uh, as a... Uh very interesting question. I don't know if he wants to uh, ask it in person, otherwise I'll go on and ask it for him. Okay. So could you please discuss the upcoming changes to the portable antiquity scheme? Um, 
I'm not quite sure. You probably mean the upcoming changes to the Treasury yes. Act. I yes, to. I think he means that, yeah. exactly. I'm, I'm slightly reluctant to, mainly because it's coming into force on Monday and I just today was provided with a large amount of documentation to read. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. I don't want to sort of advise people wrongly, but um, the information on this will be um, up on the Portal Antiquity Scheme website under the Treasure section. I mean, broadly, it's more or less the same, but there will be a new category of treasure find, which uh, is a find of, you know, exceptional national importance, uh, which could include a single coin. I don't think it will impact this period uh, as much as perhaps as later periods. Well, this is fantastic. And so I have another question for you um, from Robert, uh, Robert Runas. Uh, how many previously unknown kings or rulers have been discovered at the Tundi courts? I mean, of course, because there's been, I guess, all these huge, uh, you know, exactly about Sponsianus and so, so, yes. I'm not getting into that. <laughs> um, I think mainly that's something that's happened in the Iron Age. I mean, the, the, there's been an incredible expansion of knowledge of Iron Age people named on coins. Or do I want to call them kings and rulers? I'm very conservative about this and probably necessarily wouldn't say they were kings, but some of them have the word Rex after the name, so they clearly thought of themselves as kings or referred to them as kings. But yes, we have a lot of coins of issuers or rulers or whoever is inscribing them in the Iron Age that were previously unknown. But some of these are also coming up as single finds. Um, for example, there's the um, uh, an Iron Age um, ruler from Kent that was recently discovered and has been acquired by the Museum. And not so much in the Roman period, I think. Um, we have previously um, unassisted coins of known people, but I'm not sure we've any new people that have been discovered through coins, or if they are, they're sort of, you know, not official emperors. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Otherwise, I will ask my questions. Mm -hmm. I don't see other questions. Okay. So, uh, let's begin with this. Uh, what is, um, I see that there is, for example, in, uh, uh, during during the fourth century AD or CE, you have, have actually a change in the ratio between stray finds and hordes. Because I think in the in the I mean, as far as your maps go, for example, in the earlier part and uh, the earlier part of the fourth century, you have definitely a much larger number of stray finds than hordes, and then there seems to be a total reduction of stray finds. And then you have mm. these huge hordes. So how do you explain that, for example? Or this is true. I, I think um, I mean it's two things. One that the silica are probably not lost uh, in contemporary times and are being retained and circulating and buried and ending up in hordes at a later date. But also I think that the later fourth century base metal coinage is just very underrepresented uh, in the single finds. They're tiny, they're not very attractive, they're often very difficult to read and date, and I suspect that finders probably aren't picking these up in large numbers. It also could be that there is, you know, already a reduction in supply, which I think is likely, but I think they probably are there in more, you know, in greater numbers than have been reported. And uh, the second question for you would be, how uh, rare, or how common, but I guess it's how rare is to find, uh, um, let's say, local East, for example, East Anglian, or let's say, local silver coinage mixed with Roman coinage, of course, we're talking about earlier, uh, earlier sounds. Because you have, of course, that example of East Anglian silver coin mm -hmm with Roman uh, coinage, but how are there, is that common? How many other examples there are on your? They're not terribly common. Um, it is something that happens in that sort of southern East Anglian, sort of Suffolk, and then also a little bit into Essex. And it may be that um, some of these things seem to be happening on the boundary. This is still a very much a developing field of work, but um, we have had a award recently from Suffolk that combines um, Iron Age and 
Denarii and even Aureus. Um, so they, I'd say they come up maybe, I don't know, once every year, once every two years. They're not a common category, but they're, they're quite restricted in time. And the local coinage that tends to be combined with these Roman coins is quite late in date. Um, it's that almost that sort of conquest period. So it's obviously a time of transition. Perhaps Romans are making deals with local people or local people acquiring coins that's already reached these islands. I think it's a very interesting period. Because, for example, in, uh, in Gaul, uh, just to make, in Gaul, it's uh, basically almost unheard of to have these mixed words. So this is actually super interesting. Mm -hmm. And almost, mm -hmm. uh, and also in, uh, in Spain, only in Spain you have exactly, I mean, bronze, as far as I know, circulates, you know, you have this circulation, mixed circulation. But silver usually, I mean, silver, Birian, Denari do not mix mm. Roman Denari. So this is actually super, super interesting. I mean, uh, it is. It is. I haven't really thought about that. I think it's also uh, something to do with the later period of our conquest. So these hordes are dating to around AD 50. So obviously, in farm, things are very well established under Rome mm -hmm. by that period, and perhaps local coinage isn't being encouraged or used anymore. Okay. Um, I mean, so, uh, are there other questions? This was amazing. I mean, really, really lots of information, new information. Um, any other question for the audience? Because we reached basically 2 p.m. and we can, uh, otherwise we'll leave, uh, uh, we'll let uh, Dr. Gay <laughs> go enjoy her weekend instead of keeping her here with us for our enjoy personal enjoyment. <laughs> Um, I don't know. There's some questions in the chat about detectorists. Um, yes, I think they did yeah. film an episode at the British Museum. I wasn't involved, I'm afraid, but... Uh, <laughs> yes, Toby Jones, McKenzie group, visit with the coin board, mm -hmm. yes. Um, so anyway, thank you, and they are all thanking exactly for your for the important work of British Museum, the British Museum in analyzing, cuddling, coins and horse times in the UK. So really, thank you very much. Really, thank you. It's fantastic presentation. This was amazing.